Good afternoon, everybody, or good night, or good morning, depending on where you are. This is Carla Sainz, and PAHOS Regional Biopics Advisor. PAHOS Regional Program of Biopics is part of the Department of Health Systems and, and Services, and PAHO is the Regional Office for the Americas of the World Health Organization. I'm going to use the camera just to say hi to you initially, but uh, I'm going to turn it off uh, because it's making uh, difficult for some colleagues to um, to have a co good quality of uh, sound. Um, okay, so hi, and we'll continue without video. So the purpose of this uh, webinar is to discuss the imperative to catalyze COVID-19 ethical research. And um, as you may remember, we in the region of the Americas uh, experienced a, a public health emergency research recently. What we're trying to do in this occasion is to learn from uh, our experience during the Zika outbreak. Um, the Zika outbreak led to a lot of progress in the region of the Americas, especially I'm referring to progress conducted in countries in Latin America and the Caribbean to develop specific ethics guidance to handle the outbreak and its unfortunate consequences. And that was an, a fantastic exercise from our region. The, guidance, the ethics guidance informed, importantly, the response. And it constituted an, an important improvement uh, in our capacity, in our, our ethics preparedness uh, for emergencies. However, it also allowed us to, to uh, reflect later that a number of uh, uh, that we were still dealing with a number of challenges for which there was a, uh, available ethics guidance even before uh, the outbreak took place. So uh, we continue this critical reflection with our member states. And uh, on the basis of that, our member states, PAHO member states, in 2018 at the Directing Council agreed to strengthen our region's ethics preparedness for emergencies. We have continued working based on uh, on this mandate, and um, and building our, our, on prior experience and our available documents, we uh, have developed this uh, brief document uh, on ethics guidance on issues raised by the novel coronavirus disease by COVID-19 pandemic. And while we are aware that the countries in our region are doing uh, are way better prepared to handle the ethical challenges uh, of uh, uh, post the pandemic and specifically the ethical challenges of conducting COVID-19 research. We're very aware that some challenges remain and some challenges are also exacerbating by the pandemic dimension of uh, what was initially an outbreak that we thought could be controlled. So the um, the goal of this uh, webinar is to focus on the imperative, the, the, on, on the key issues on which we're still having, um, having experiencing challenges. And, and when I say we, I, see, I refer myself, I refer primarily to the countries in Latin America and the Caribbean. And to, to uh, strengthen our ability to respond to these challenges. So, one thing that we ought to highlight is that we have an imperative to conduct ethical COVID-19 research quickly. COVID-19, as you well know, is a new, a new virus, new disease, and while we have to make sure that we don't take uh, resources that are used from the res uh, for the response, we must produce knowledge quickly to inform the response. Uh, we're in a difficult situation because, because it's not clear what we ought to do. What We don't have a treatment that we know works. We're trying a number of things. We don't have a vaccine either. And we're trying a number of things to produce, to, to uh, uh, address the challenges in the best possible way. Research is essential to, uh, uh, to answer the questions that we're, that we're struggling with. But we must remind ourselves the research conducted during emergencies must be higher, if anything, to higher, but never to lower ethical standards. 
So yes, we must conduct research now, and yes, that research must adhere to, to ethical standards. It's not acceptable to say that since research is urgent, therefore we, uh, we're justified in bypassing ethical standards, precisely because, because it's a moment in which a trust is essential. We have to ensure extreme cautious, caution with the ethical safeguards to ensure that research is ethical. So it is urgent in this situation to, to coordinate with health authorities so the research can uh, inform the decisions as quickly as possible. So the imperative to conduct research quickly leads to an obvious uh, uh, challenge, which is the, the imperative to do ethics review quickly. And I've come to uh, um, appreciate during the Zika outbreak the number of challenges that this, uh, uh, that this implies. So because ethics review is a procedural requirement, there is the perception that if the procedure is not followed, then, uh, uh, then the review itself is not ethical. That's not the case. We, the, doing ethics review quickly of COVID-19 research is a matter of urgency. So we have the obligation, we have the moral duty to depart from the normal way in which we do ethics review processes. We cannot do business as usual here. We cannot say, oh yeah, great, we, have, we got a protocol, we have a, review, a, a meeting next month. And this is difficult because at least in the region of the Americas, at least in Latin America and the Caribbean, in the Caribbean we mo for the most part, we do not have previously approved procedures to conduct ethics review during emergency. In a, in a better world, we would have our SOPs for ethics review and emergencies ready and available and approved and what have you. That is not the case. So we have to, to come up with these procedures for rapid ethics review as we conduct the ethics review. So what are the ideas that should be guiding this departure of the normal way we do business, we must make sure we avoid duplications and delays. We have to make sure that there's not going to be a one-size-fits-all solution. It's not going to be the case that we find a way the, the procedure to do the ethics review quickly and applies in all circumstances. We do have, uh, in Latin America and the Caribbean, very diverse, countries with very diverse arrangements in, in terms of research ethics governance. Uh, we must ensure that these rapid procedures don't com do not come up at the expenses of a rigorous ethics review. We must ensure that rigor is preserved while we do the ethics review quickly. And, uh, and for this, for this uh, uh, initial circumstance where we have to come up with the procedures pretty much at the same time that we have, to, we have to do the rapid ethics review, you can count on PAHO's support. We have an expert team uh, that, is, um, that includes uh, Ana Palmero from Argentina and Sara Carracedo from Peru, both are research ethics experts involved in, um, in their own, working at their own health authorities, so they have first-hand experience about the procedures. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, they're working on a project to develop guidance for Latin America and the Caribbean to do rapid ethics review of research during emergencies. And the project was developed in April. So we planned on this in April, not knowing that COVID-19 was coming. But this is being an opportunity for us and the organization to, as it were, test in practice what we thought would work for rapid ethics review. And we are committed uh, to having, once COVID-19 is over, a meeting to reflect and assess and, 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 and uh, uh, revise the guidance that we as an organization give to our communities and ensure that there is, and, and, our, and, and the countries in the region, and ensure that there's learning uh, from this experience, that we all can figure out what worked, what didn't work. I'm happy to share with you that we're already seeing some regional achievements. We've had discussions about this, as I was saying before, since Zika, but truth is that we started conversations with many regional authorities uh, since uh, Ebola. And for example, uh, 
we propose some some possible paths to colleagues in, in, in Brazil's National Research Ethics Committee, CONEP, and they went they they proceeded to make those procedures for rapid ethics review during COVID uh, uh, official as soon as the outbreak start, started. And for example, they have managed to conduct a rigorous ethics review of the of the of WHO solidarity protocol within 24 hours. They're meeting every day. They're distributing the pr protocols immediately. So one of the reasons why I organized this webinar and the one um, um, yesterday in Spanish is that I want to urge you to not wait until you receive, you meaning your country, your national health authority, your committee, until you receive a COVID-19 protocol to come up with a plan for an accelerated ethics review of, of COVID-19 protocols. We cannot sit and wait. We're already in a situation that's way more urgent than we, what we had anticipated. So we should anticipate that we will receive, in every country, in every committee, there will be uh, 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 submissions on COVID-19. So we must plan now what to do later. And as I was saying before, there is no one size fits all. Uh, what worked in Brazil that has a two a, a two layer review by a local committee, the national committee, was to bypass the the local uh, um, the the review of the local committee and go straight to the national committee. The national committee had specific processes, quick processes. But a number of nothing is written in stone, and a number of options are being discussed. And uh, for the idea is to avoid applications to do a review quickly. In some countries, there is some countries have arrangements like Brazil. Actually, those are very few. Uh, but some countries have what they call national research ethics committees that review only certain protocols and can uh, uh, and seem ad, um, appropriate to review the COVID, COVID protocols. In some countries, those those uh, committees are, they're called the National Research Ethics Committee, but they're committee of, the Committee of the National Health Authority, and they may, they may be well positioned to de do this review rapidly. And in other countries, what's been discussed, what's been established, is an ad hoc uh, ethics review committee involving different institutions that will do one and quick ethics review of the COVID-19 protocols. So uh, one thing that's been done in the region, I can comfortably uh, 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 give uh, Argentina, for example, as an example, is that uh, things were being done sim simultaneously. Uh, so the National Regulatory Authority was conducting its review. At the same time, the Ethics Review Committee was doing the, um, the review of the, um, the Ethics Review of the Protocol. And they had coordinated before, so they were going to approve simultaneously when the observations raised by both of them were being uh, uh, addressed by the, by the investigators. So uh, sim moving on simultaneously is uh, very important in these circumstances that requires prior coordination. And in general, we, I think we all need to think about in what, which of our normal procedures we must adjust in these circumstances. So we all have, we all require a number of documents. Well, perhaps we should start a review process. We should start reading the protocol just well, as soon as we get the essential documents. And, you know, and assume that some documents will be uh, uh, received while the review is, has been initiated. Uh, calling for virtual meetings immediately is key. Uh, our colleagues from Brazil's CONEP were telling us that they they had the protocols assigned to ad hoc reviewers every day, and they're having meetings every single evening. And what they're doing, and another important recommendation is to consider a smaller quorum than usual. Uh, a pre-identified quorum might be important, uh, meaning you know ensuring that you have your most senior, most expert person. Considering ad hoc membership of for example, virologists with relevant expertise uh, uh, for COVID-19. Uh, for COVID So um, as I was saying, we are working at PAHO 
on specific guidance to manage ethics review processes quickly in prior situations of emergencies, like for example, during the uh, last year's, uh, um, last year's Guillain-Barre outbreak in Peru, we were asked to serve as observers and, 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 and support the review, we, I mean PAHO Ethics Review Committee, to, to be involved as part of the review process of uh, um, the, the um, protocol to study that emergency. Uh, you can count on PAHO to support you. We will have uh, uh, guidance uh, published for this soon, but we're working already with many countries uh, producing uh, or, or figuring out and, and, and implementing processes for rapid review quickly. And what we're trying to do, and I really encourage you to reach out to me if this is something that you would like uh, uh, help with, we're encouraging dialogue and learning from what each of the other countries are doing. So um, just let us know and we will help. So, but just focusing on the need to do ethics review quickly uh, uh, does not highlight an issue that has been historically challenging for the region of the Americas, which is what exactly need, needs ethics review and what doesn't. Uh, this was, uh, I mean, the, the, the case book case uh, uh, um, comes from SARS, the challenges in the U.S. figuring out whether whether uh, uh, some uh, uh, actions were constituted research or not and needed ethics review or not. We've encountered that in the region also with H1N1. Our health authorities uh, have expressed that they moved in this kind of gray territory that transition uh, uh, from the response, the work of the health authority to protect the health of the population to research, and that led to a number of studies conducted without proper ethics review, and that unfortunately those studies have not been published till now. So we have to make sure that we also help our, our, our research community uh, with, uh, in our ethics review committee with a better understanding of what needs ethics review and what doesn't. This was a question that we at PAHO received many times in the context of Zika. And you will see that, that um, the COVID-19 guidance has a section specifically on this. It's under the public health um, uh, uh, mini section. So long story short, research with human subjects requires ethics review. Many activities that are that involve collection of data, including collection of individually identifiable data, are not research. So for something to be research, it needs to aim at produ producing generalizable knowledge. This is, this, I'm just relying on the definitions that is available in a number of guidances. And uh, if you go to the document, if you go to the to PAHO's um, uh, Zika or COVID ethics guidance, you will see the re relevant references there. And one of our favorite ones from our committee, our research ethics committee at PAHO, is the CDC guidance to distinguish public health research from public health non research. And I'm going to share with you why we find that particularly useful. It has examples. So when things become complicated, there's, I mean, we just look at the examples and they, they, they always uh, uh, help illuminating uh, the challenging case. At any rate, before proceeding with this very quick, rigorous ethics review, we must check if the proposal we have received is research with human subjects or not. If it's research with human subjects, it must be reviewed, it must be reviewed quickly. If it's not, it must be exempted from ethics review. And it must adhere to the relevant guidance. For example, now we have ethical guideline, guidance developed by WHO for epidemiological surveillance, which is a public, an essential public health activity and should not be treated like research in order to ensure it's conducted ethically. It, has a di it follows a different uh, a normative framework, which is the framework of public health ethics. 
and uh, that little picture is of the cover of the uh, of WHO's um, ethics guidance for public health surveillance, and it's available at our website and also at WHO's. So, uh, just one more word about the the how do we figure out whether something is related with human subjects or not? The 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 content guidance on whether it aims at regional, generalizable knowledge and whether it in, in, includes research uh, of persons as, as subjects. That, that's the content, right? Those are the two criteria. But it's important to uh, uh, have some sort of procedure. Who's going to be making that decision? Uh, who's going to be making this assessment about whether something needs, re needs ethics review or not? Uh, it's, we do not advise uh, that the, the, the ones responsible for those activities make those decisions because they are in a position of conflict of interest. Some institutions like CDC or NIH have a separate office in charge of these determinations in the majority of countries in Latin America and the Caribbean. It is ethics review committees that assume the task of doing these determinations and there's I just, I'm going to share you, for example, what our process is at PAHO ERC, PAHO Ethics Review Committee for these determinations. We receive the proposals, we do, uh, uh, we do a quick screening by email based on the, the key components of the proposals, and if three members of the committee agree the proposal is research with human subjects or not, and we can have a quick discussion sometimes by email, then we proceed based on that. So on top of the criteria for decision, we have a little process. It's usually very easy, sometimes it's hard, and if you need uh, help with that, we, we often, I mean, PAHO's regional program on bioethics, we often uh, um, are asked to help with decisions of this nature, but we just want to make sure, I mean, we ought to do surveillance, we ought to do research, and we ought to do both ethically, but doesn't mean that surveillance has to be treated like research or the other way around, okay? So, um, I want to switch to a different imperative now, which is the imperative to conduct, uh, to catalyze future COVID-19 research. So, there are protocols that we have now. They're written now, they're ready to undergo ethics review now, okay? But there are protocols that will be developed later. Later can be in a month, later can be in a year, okay? And but, but like every time we're dealing with an outbreak, the samples, the data that we will not, that we don't collect now will not be magically produced later for research purposes. So what we ought to do is that we should actively promote broad consent, and that may include uh, opt-out consent, to use that, the, those samples that we're collecting now in future studies in studies that will be developed later and will be submitted for ethics review later. And uh, so this broad, the broad consent to use samples that we're, that we're collecting now in future studies is not exclusive to research. I'm also talking about samples that, uh, like clinical, that, that, that we come across in other circumstances, like clinical care, like remnants from, you know, testing or surveillance. The idea is that how do we, uh, how do we make sure that we ask people now if it's okay to use later down the road those samples in future studies that will be conducted ethically, meaning that if those studies uh, uh, include those samples in a way that's identifiable, that, that uh, they go, they undergo prior ethics review, that confidentiality is treated the way it's supposed to be treated, and so on and so forth. So I think we, we must be proactive. We cannot put ourselves in a situation in which we fail to collect or we fail to ask if those collected samples can be used for future research now. I don't think it's responsible to just say, well, you know, if someone comes up with a study, a pro proposal later, they can reconsent those subjects, those people that gave those samples, or we just 
can count on waivers. That path will uh, not be, will uh, uh, hamper a good amount of socially valuable research. So let's, let's be proactive. Let's ask now, and uh, there are a number of studies about broad consent. Broad consent is not used exclusively in the context of outbreaks, but I think it's more urgent in the context of outbreaks because we have, we can collect COVID-19 uh, uh, samples only due while COVID-19 is circulating. So if we don't, it, it, it's a different situation than, I don't know, some, uh, HIV samples that can be collected at any time. Uh, we understand that in the, the regulatory or normative frameworks in countries in the region, and uh, we know some of them, may be not conducive to broad consent or may, or uh, ethics review committees may not be comfortable with broad consent we can, with, we're working with some countries now, modifying the current regulations, uh, and uh, we have had very, um, very positive experiences clarifying the most updated ethical standards for uh, um, consent for, for broad consent for future studies uh, with countries in the region. Uh, in general. There's a reason for this, uh, uh, for the current framework, and, it's, and that is that we have improved, we've evolved, we've progressed in our understanding of consent for use of samples in future research. And not all the frameworks and not all the procedures of committees and not all the normative uh, guidelines that are be follow, being followed in each of the countries uh, uh, has, um, uh, has been updated to, you know, like the the most uh, uh, the, the the guidelines that we have now. What I'm saying is entirely consistent with what is in uh, in the new version of Sion. Just like many of our frameworks are way older. So, uh, it another relevant imperative to the conduct of research is the imperative to share data and research results to advance a better response. We have to share quickly complete data of the highest possible quality. We have had experiences, this seems a very obvious thing to say, but again and again we've encountered challenges. And we've encountered challenges of many sorts and I want to highlight that this is an imperative that applies to everybody doing research, including public health authorities. It's not just for the private sector, it's not just for the academia, it's for everybody. We must share uh, 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 data and research results for a better response without delays. Uh, there's uh, always the fear that uh, sharing, making public these results, we will, will uh, not make it possible to publish the results in, in good journals, but I want you to remind you that medical journals have rules that are adequate to this situation, and um, so they uh, um, include, you know, uh, of course, uh, open access, and it's clear now that prior publication of, uh, of this data will not preempt publication in journals. So this is, we should remind researchers that this is not something to be feared. And uh, it's, it's a, something that is, this data sharing uh, is necessary to, so we all make sure that the best evidence informs the response to COVID-19 all over, not just in the country where the studies are being conducted. Um, I think it is important that we all in this context uh, do a little bit of ethics advocacy in research, but also in other aspects of the response. Research ethics, the research ethics community in a region is, uh, um, is perhaps, as it were, like the stronger pillar of bioethics. So we have the duty to, uh, uh, to do ethics advocacy in research, but also beyond research. 
uh, one thing that is essential in this circumstance is the duty to inform the population about the importance of conducting research on COVID-19 and the existence of safeguards to, to ensure that such research is ethical. But as I said, and, and, and I think that this is something that must be highlighted, uh, the, the broader public is usually not aware of how research is done and there's fear in the current pandemic and every effort to inform the population about what happens when you do research and how we work to make sure research is ethical is important. important. But also, as I was saying, we have to go beyond research. We have, um, in Latin America and the Caribbean, the, res the uh, research community is most aware about ethics uh, it's more aware about ethics than uh, the public health community that is not involved in research. So I think that because of this, this uh, uh, circumstance, the research ethics community has to, has to raise awareness, awareness about ethics in other areas that are not related to research, like public health. And we also should uh, uh, endeavor to advance adherence to the relevant ethics ethics guidance in those other scenarios like public health. We have valuable um, guidance on public health ethics that is relevant. We have, uh, for example, WHO's guidance for managing ethical issues in infectious disease outbreaks um, that is uh, uh, available, unfortunately, not in Spanish, but, uh, but it is available in English and it covers many issues that are essential uh, in the current uh, uh, response to COVID-19, uh, from resource allocation to uh, restriction of freedom of movement. And that's been developed based on prior uh, WHO guidance on um, uh, uh, planning uh, an ethical response to the uh, pandemic flu. That's a blue book uh, that is behind um, that is in the in the slide, and you can find this all in the um, uh, in WHO's website, or you can email me, and I'm happy to share them if you have any challenge. As uh, novel as this uh, pandemic is, it faces us with issues that ethicists have been discussing for a long period of time. They may be new for it for. Uh, uh, the broader population and even for some people working in health, but we do have useful guidance for this circumstance and we have to remind the, the, ourselves of that and use what we got. So, uh, well, thank you so much for your uh, uh, attention. We're gonna, if you have uh, any questions or comments, I would really appreciate if you type it in the um, Q and A, or if I can open it, or well, Marcy can help me with that. Uh, so um, that's the website of Pajos Regional Bioethics Program, and um, that's the email. We, if if you need any help with any of these issues, if you want Pajos Regional Program Bioethics to help uh, uh, at dealing with the ethical challenges that that can be posed by the epidemic, please uh, let us know. We have two listservs and information in both gets sent in both English and Spanish every single time. One is focused on research and the other one is focused on public health ethics. And um, that is the, um, the ethics guidance, the, the surveillance guidance and uh, research science uh, uh, guidelines. And uh, just before I and I want to um, mention that at the beginning, I posted on the chat for everybody a, uh, a, doc, a, a site that uh, our colleagues at Pajon, especially Ludovic Reves, are developing just uh, to uh, some sort of like repository of key evidence for COVID-19. As you all know, good ethics uh, needs good facts. So we need good evidence, and I think that's essential to move forward ethically. I think this is um, this is a um, a key uh, issue to keep in mind. So um, 
So we have a question from Gloria Palma from uh, Colombia. Uh, so her, the question is like, I, yeah, I think I E C that that uh, ethics review committee I understand must also start thinking ahead about how to follow how follow up will be conducted for these projects that are reviewed during the crisis. Yeah, exactly, I think that's a very good point that we often forget to discuss. I feel like sometimes in our discussions about research ethics, we just think about ethics review as the moment where, you know, you push a little card and it goes God knows where after you push it, right? You've got, you've got to go, you're approved. But we're not as good as we should be thinking how we follow up the, the review, we follow, how we follow up, how we monitor uh, uh, approved research. And in the current circumstance, that is going to be more challenging and more important than in other circumstances. Why? Because as you probably noticed already, every single, every single day um, there's relevant evidence published. So protocols are being reviewed. They have, uh, say you review a protocol today, a COVID-19 protocol today, and what looks perfectly reasonable in terms of like a, an adequate positive uh, balance of benefits over risks might not be an ethical, not, might not be a positive balance of benefits over risks in three months. So we have to keep that in mind. And, uh, and I think that's one thing that, that is essential and that we should include in our guidance, in our PAHO guidance that, uh, uh, for for um for committees to pay attention to from the begin since the moment of uh of the approval um, people are requested the presentation both present uh, um i i cannot send it through the list but we can send it by email if you reach out to us and we will be sending the videos we've recorded the um We've recorded the presentations and we'll share them through the list. Uh, somehow, oh, there we go. Um, um, trying to read through the questions. I, uh, um, Jessica Candanello is highlighting that in Panama they do have uh, procedures for ethics review in these cases. Um, and I, I think it's been a really interesting experience that this pandemic started, I mean, the outbreak started where we were at a moment where we had worked with many countries, not just raising awareness about these procedures, but supporting them on the development of those procedures. And we encountered that many of them were being, were already, um, were already uh, awaiting official approval. But that's Certainly not the, the case in any can, in every country in the region. We've had colleagues working overnight to develop those procedures, and as I said, uh, please reach out to us so we can we can help. We're trying to do a um, just I'm, I'm borrowing from my colleagues in WHO that called the the, the COVID-19 the mega, mega protocol, the solidarity protocol. We're doing the solidarity rapid assets review chain here in Latin America, and we're happy to help. So um, there's a, uh, uh, Abraham Weeks has a, uh, a comment, he believes ethics advocacy should be publicized more because in this current COVID-19 pandemic, many persons are in a rush to use unapproved medicines for treatment. I think it's very important that we do uh, ethics advocacy for a number of reasons and that, and that people that are um, involved in an ethics analysis of health, and that ethicists uh, are participating in many discussions because I fear, I fear that sometimes we also make things that we do normally look completely foreign. And I think I, I agree, I agree with you. And I think that uh, people with expertise on research ethics also ought to advance public health ethics guidelines. Uh, when available and have the you know the uh, um just share that you know for something sometimes in, in 
in, in our region, uh, there's this people discuss as if it uh, ethics is some sort of like private property of, of research, and we tend to forget that there are ethical guidance for public health too. So I'm I'm not having the best um, the best view of um, um, okay here. Somehow I'm not getting both the chat and the um, and the um, and the uh, Q and A. So uh, Diva Barrientos from Guatemala uh, points out that in her country the approval process is very slow. Uh, at the um, the Ministry of Health, and now there's the, the in this context when there's need to start a start a COVID-19 study, it's going to be very it's going to be very difficult to do so because of the of the slow approval process. Uh, I would really encourage you to to reach out to us to to reach out to the public health authorities. I know this there's it's a difficult moment because you've had. Uh, uh, it's a moment of transition in Guatemala. We we had developed with the National Health Authority a draft of a national policy for Guatemala that was awaiting approval before the authorities uh, 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 changed, and that did include some basic general guidance for ethics, uh, uh, rapid ethics review and protocols, uh, a, a rapid ethics review of research during emergencies, and perhaps this. Uh, uh, this pandemic will be the uh, will lead to its approval because uh, because of the need for rapid ethics review. But I have to tell you, even in the absence of formal processes for ethics review, such ethics review will have to be conducted quickly. And we uh, we uh, as PAHO we will support the National Health Authority to do the rapid ethics review as needed. Uh, we understand that, you know, having to do something without clear procedures is is uh, uh, worrisome, is scary, and no one wants to be caught doing the wrong thing, let alone a pandemic. But we can help in these circumstances. Uh, here, I think I got there's something in the Q and A. Somehow not. Marcy, I don't know if you're catching a. Uh, uh, Something that I may be missing in terms of any other question or comment? Um, can you see in the Q and A? Let me check. It comes and goes. <laughs> is that Eva Barrientos? Yes. Um, oh, Abraham Weeks again. I, I. Okay, great. Thank you. Concerning the solidarity trial, is there some way that there could be an arm in the Caribbean, uh, a, a site? I, um, you know, the solidarity trial is uh, um, um, it's coordinated directly by by uh, WHO. I understand that they were reaching out to several countries, uh, and from the region of the Americas, I know it's being conducted. It will be conducted in. Canada, Brazil, Argentina, uh, Peru, and I, those, those are the countries that I know so far are, uh, uh, have some sort of commitment uh, uh, to do it or, or are already ready to roll it. And, um, I, and the person at WHO is, um, is Ana Maria Enao Restrepo. And I, I'm happy if if there's a country that's interested in being a site. As I said, this is uh, this is something that WHO is handling directly. But you know, I can be a matchmaker, and uh, and if you email me, I will direct the the request to my my counterpart in um, in WHO. So I saw that Jessica had. Uh, Candanedo had a question. Will PAHO ensure that local ethics review is done in every country involved where there are regulatory procedures established? We will, I don't know if you mean for the solidarity trial. Um, for the solidarity trial, WHO will ensure that local ethics 
uh, uh, review is obtained, and we are collaborating with the countries to ensure that such ethics review is done, done expediently, fast. We have not been involved in any uh, any of the actual review processes, as would you know, it's happened in other circumstances, like the example I was giving you about um, from the um, from the Guillain Barre outbreak in Peru. So far, the countries uh, themselves have been they've done the, the ethics review entirely on their own with their committee. We've just supported um, figuring out quick process if needed. So as I said, if you send me an email to bioethics at bajo.org expressing your country's interest to participate in the trial, if that's, uh, um, I'm happy to pass it to my colleagues at WHO, but, but as I said, this is uh, because this is not something just in the region of the Americas, but this is a global effort. It's being coordinated by um, by WHO directly, and I'd be happy to uh, to pass to my WHO colleagues. Uh, my colleague in charge of research ethics is Catherine Littler. I'd be happy to to pass uh, um, to have pass it uh, uh, already to them. Um, Jessica uh, Candanero points out that Panama is, will be um, will be uh, participating in the solidarity trial, and it has been um, and it's been announced in TV. That's how many colleagues have found out that are participating. And uh, oh, there's an aspect of of uh, Jessica's question that I had not answered. So she was saying, will PAHO ensure that local ethics review is done in every country? Involved where the regulatory procedures established. I I answered it for the solidarity trial. Uh, we we strongly urge all countries and all research institutions and all research to make sure that all COVID-19 research with that research with human subjects is conducted with prior ethics approval. But we are we are aware that in many countries in the region, the current regulations only require ethics approval for a subset of clinical trials, namely clinical trials with therapeutics and devices. So we are, um, one of our biggest campaigns at PAHO for the work on research ethics, and you may have seen our research ethics indicators that are guiding our technical cooperation in the region, is that every country in the region moves to having a, a, a research ethics governance system for all research with human subjects. We, we think that, that the, the research that's going to be produced, that when I say COVID-19 research, I do not mean exclusively tr clinical trials using the broader WHO definition, definition, and I do not mean exclusively clinical trials with therapeutics and devices, with drugs and devices. I mean all research with human subjects, and we think that there's going to be a lot of research with human subjects uh, in the region, initiated by the region, fully developed in the region, that is not a clinical trial. So we must, and, and which really shows the urgency to expanding the scope of the governance of uh, research ethics in the region. So far in many countries, and I'll just give you the example of Guatemala, because I was referring to the document, the, the, the policy that was uh, um, undergoing approval. Currently, for example, in Guatemala, if you look at the existing uh, regs, only clinical trials with therapeutics and devices are um, need ethics approval. It's the same situation in my country, Peru. So um, it's in an emergency when we realize how urgent some of the work we need to do is. Um, so uh, there are some other questions. Uh, um, Aime from Brazil says that the government is calling for graduates to act on the front lines in hospitals against uh, the epidemic. And well, she asked me for an opinion, but this is a webinar on research ethics. Uh, I'm just going to say something very brief on that. If you go to the previous 
um, I, I think there's relevant guidance in these two documents. And in general, I, I can imagine that the rationale uh, of the government is that, you know, because COVID-19 is, uh, uh, is significantly more dangerous the older you get, the younger your healthcare workforce is, workforce is the, the less risk they'll be, you know, exposed to, the less uh, severe uh, the disease will be in your healthcare workforce. This is an argument that's being discussed in a number of, uh, in a number of countries, and that'd be the motivation and um, and uh, well, I'm just gonna <laughs> leave it there so we can focus on on our research topics. I see. Um, I see. There's a question on the Q and A. Here we. Somehow I'm not. Marcy, I don't know if you can help me. Somehow I'm not getting the um. I'm not getting the nice interface that I was having yesterday. Um, I have 16 in the Q&A, and the last one was Abraham Weeks. Okay, so, so I got it. I don't know, right? Yeah. Uh-huh. And I have asked people for their email addresses, and I'm taking them down for people who said they wanted the Spanish. So we'll, we'll be seeing that later on. Okay, so I think that we're good then, and there are not more uh, uh, comments uh, uh, or questions. I I assume you all had uh, our our document, our guidance. Uh, it does have a section on public health ethics. This session was to focus on the on the research uh, uh, the research ethics topics. Just and merely referring to public health ethics to the extent that I'm calling you to be advocates for ethics in public health too. Uh, well, thank you very much for your participation and uh, we look forward to support you once again as needed. I'm gonna move to this uh, uh, slide so you can get the, the email there of the regional program on bioethics and I'm just gonna uh, put my camera again to Say you bye. Good afternoon. Good evening. Stay well. Thank you so much.